Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Center for Bioengineering and Biotechnology's first inaugural visionary lecture. It is our pleasure today to have Sunit uh, uh, Singh be Thule, Singh Thule be our first lecturer for this series. Uh, I first met uh, Sunit uh, about a year ago uh, at a symposium that was studying the intelligent community and how we were going to uh, redesign our education to create leaders for the future uh, for our global community. And Sunit was the guest honorary speaker for that. And I was truly inspired by his uh, presentation. It showed to me that there could be innovation with a social conscious, and it could be entrepreneurial as well. And uh, so I thought, we've got to get Sunit to the University of Waterloo. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce to you the director for the Center for Bioengineering and Biotechnology, CBB as we call it for short, Catherine Burns. Uh, Catherine, would you introduce our speaker? Thank you, Shirley, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this is definitely an honor to have Sunit present to us today. I think, in general, at Waterloo, most of us are working in technology, right, and having technology that has an impact. And I think that's what's really special about our speaker today is that he's talking about an impact on a different scale with a different level of reach. Okay? And it's something that I think we should all be aware of. Uh, because these are the kinds of problems that we need to be thinking about, and we need to be thinking about where we fit in in this world, which is changing around us. Sunita is a very well-recognized speaker, so we're very lucky to be able to have him here. Um, I, he was recognized in MIT's Technology Review in 2014. DataWind was recognized as one of the 50 smartest companies. Okay. And in, I think it was 2012, uh, Sunit was listed as the Forbes impact list of classroom revolutionaries. Okay, so I'm going to let you take it over at this point, but I'm going to encourage you to enjoy the talk. And also, we've left a lot of time for Q&A afterwards. Okay, so please, um, I think, get engaged. I mean, that's why we we're having this and why we're having you here. Okay, so please speak up and engage in a conversation on this. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. Um, uh, it's, it's an honor to be doing the inaugural lecture. Um, and I, I don't know if that adds to the pressure or if it reduces the pressure, but, but, um, but I'll give you my, 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 uh, my regular kind of talk. Uh, a lot of the time when I get introduced, um, to talk about uh, the social good. The impact on education and, and, and that part of it, uh, and and, uh, and I, I think that the social conscious has something to do with uh, with what we're doing. But I'll tell you, a lot of it has to do with opportunity. Um, I'm uh, second generation in Canada, and um, when I go back to India or or go back and do work in the developing world. Uh, you know, people think it's, it's, you know, coming back for the social good, it's, it's an obligation. And I try to explain to them that uh, maybe that's part of it, but really the big part of it is opportunity. And I, and I think that, um, I, I hope that you'll agree with me as I go through this, that uh, if we think of the big opportunities over the next, uh, next few years, that, that uh, this, is, this is certainly one of them. Uh, you know, very few markets, uh, very few opportunities where you can talk about billions of people trying to, trying to connect or impact a very, very large number of people. But I thought, l let me start with, you know, how we come up with that number. When you look at the penetration of cell phone users, and you look at the penetration of internet users, until the late 90s, there was very little difference in the two numbers. And then you started to get a little bit of a difference and that difference increased. So much so that there are six and a half billion mobile phone subscribe subscriptions out there in the world today. Seven billion people and six and a half billion wireless subscribers. 
Now, that's misleading in, uh, a little bit. Six and a half billion people don't use the cell phones, um, but there's enough with multiples of them for that number to grow up that big. The number of people that use the internet is barely about two and a half billion. Four and a half billion people around the world don't use the internet today. And most of them are in India, Africa, and Latin America. And if you start to look at the reasons why they don't use the internet, um, we, we can only bring it down to two key reasons. And it's not the traditional ones. The traditional ones were power. Hey, people don't use cell phones in Africa, uh, use uh, the internet in Africa because there's a lack of uh, electricity. And it's a dark continent. Uh, these pictures from space show you lack of electricity, and that's why they don't use the internet. And that's not true. There are more cell phone subscriptions in Africa than there are people in Africa. They've figured out how to charge up their mobile phones. If you ever go to one of these places, I remember a trip to South Africa a couple of years ago. Uh, there are, every other corner has a kiosk and says phone charging. And people that don't have charging at home drop off their phone for a few hours, get it charged, and have it last another day, and then come back again. So lack of electricity isn't the reason, because anybody that has a cell phone has figured out how to charge that phone. The other one that people give you is, they say, well, it's the complexity. Uh, you know, these guys have never used computers. Who's going to actually teach them how to use computers? It's the complexity why they don't do it. And in fact, that was the reason that people thought that cell phones would never take off in a place like India. They said, look, there are 30 million landlines. In a country of 1.2 billion people, there are only 30 million landlines. Not enough people have used regular phones. How are they going to figure out how to use cell phones? And 15 years ago, most people wrote off the opportunity for cell phones in India. And there were maybe about 15 to 20 million cell phone subscribers in that country. Uh, and most of the cell phone companies were going bankrupt. Then five or six years later, they were signing up 20 million new subscribers every month. And today you've got 900, 900 million subscribers in India. Complexity is not the reason, and if this anecdote counts for anything, uh, watch what happens when a two-year-old is throwing a tantrum or a three-year-old is throwing a tantrum and a parent passes them an iPad or some sort of a tablet and just see how they start adopting to those. Good user interfaces, touch screens, and so on have changed the, the complexity of these systems. I remember when we first moved to Canada in 1979, and um, I think it was an Apple IIe. Um, Lisa came, I think, a couple of years later, and then the Mac in 84. But you know, even those computers required training to learn how to boot them up and how to boot them down. It wasn't that straightforward. And then with the iPad, Apple decided that you didn't need a user manual. That product doesn't come with a hard user manual. You, you, you expect it to, to intuitively figure that out. Um, I don't think complexity is the reason. Uh, and we've done tests and we've done studies that, that show exactly that. We did a hackathon. Uh, in India with one of the universities, a university called IIT Kanpur, and the students created a point of sale terminal for people that sell fruits and vegetables on carts. Average monthly income of about $150. And they were trying to figure out, do one of these $50 tablets, phablets, uh, can they be justified as a point of sale terminal? So what we realized was that we had a user base that had reasonable numeracy skills, but very low levels of literacy. Can you create a point of sale terminal that they would actually be able to use and want to use? And there was a group of students that created a graphical user interface that took all the complexity away from a CRM, <coughs> inventory management accounting system, and created a point of sale terminal for these students, for, 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 these, for these people, that changes how their business works. I don't think complexity is the reason. So our belief is that there are two key reasons. One is affordability. 
$150 average monthly salary. Half of that goes towards food. And with what's left, there are not a lot of iPads being bought. Um, the second one is that even though there is a cellular infrastructure that they're using, the infrastructure doesn't do a good job with delivering the internet. Uh, landline infrastructure, coming back to India, the number of broadband connections in this country of 1.2 billion is only about 15 million. That's it. 15 million broadband connections for 250 million families in that country. Um, so you're relegated to the cellular infrastructure. And the cellular infrastructure is congested um, and just not, doesn't do a great job for delivering the internet. And these are the two key barriers that we decided that we needed to solve if we were going to go after uh, getting these sort of next few billion people on the internet. Um, so one of the things we had to figure out is what is the right price point? What is the target price point that you see cell phone, uh, you, that you see internet penetration take off? And to understand that, we started looking at other markets. And we looked at specifically the US to figure out when did PC penetration in the US really take off? You know, when, when did that inflection point happen? And what we discovered was that it was probably sometime in 1998 or 1999 when the cost of the average computer dropped below $1,000 and it was within a week of salary for that target customer. And the moment it got to within a week of salary, it really took off. And we said, well, does that apply to a place like India? And we had data on when cell phone penetration took off. And what we discovered was that cell phones took off in that market when the average selling price for a cell phone dropped below $35. And for that target market, it was a week of salary. So we had to figure out, can we create a $35 computer that can deliver a reasonable internet experience? And as we've been doing this for a few years now, today when I talk about it, at least to me in my mind, it doesn't seem like a big challenge. You know, when you've been doing something for a while, it just doesn't seem like that big a deal. Except two years ago or three years ago when I talked about $35, uh, that was jaw dropping. People would say, wow, how is that possible? And now it's like, okay, well, what's the big deal? So it's a $35 computer. N nothing stops you from making a $35 computer anymore. Um, except I don't think that that's hit bottom yet. Uh, we are targeting a 1999 price point uh, for next summer in the US. And we think that pricing will go down below zero. And I'll explain what I mean by below zero uh, within the next, uh, next little while. The other issue, apart from affordability, is the issue of the network. The networks have gone through a lot of evolution around the world. There was the original analog networks. Then you started to get digital networks. There was 2G. Then you started to get the first set of packet-based networks, and that was 2.5G GPRS, and then edge networks. And then you got to third generation UMTS and HSPA, HSDPA, HSPA plus networks. Uh, and now, uh, in most of uh, North America, you've got LTE, the fourth generation networks. Um, in India, about five or six years ago, they auctioned off spectrum for the third generation networks. And the hope was that that would become pervasive. Except what's happened is that in six years, only about 20% of the geographic coverage is 3G networks. So out of the 450,000 mobile towers that cover that geography, less than 80,000 towers produce 3G signals. The rest of it is still 2, 2.5G. And while the theoretical throughput is 128 kilobits per second, the real throughput is somewhere between 20 to 30 kbps. So you've got to figure out, can you deliver the internet on 20 or 30 kbps? Or can you come up with about three to $400 billion to upgrade this infrastructure. So we thought that sounds like a tougher option. Let's see, is there a way to deliver the internet on the existing networks that, that are already 
in these places. To make the device low cost, in fact, while we take lots of credit for it, uh, I think Google had a lot more to do with it than we did. What Google did was they made the operating system free. They put a lot of resources towards it. They made it open source and said, here you go. They even allowed companies like Amazon to scrape Google out of it and put out a variation of the Android operating system and said, I don't need to call it Android, and away we go. But they did some other, thing, other things that were interesting. They created an ecosystem around that operating system to monetize that operating system. So they said, well, you can deploy the Microsoft solution and pay them a licensing fee, or you can deploy ours for free, and we'll show you how to make money off of that operating system. And so what happened? Well, everybody decided to make Android devices. But it wasn't just the operating system. They did something very interesting around the CPU. The CPU was limited to Intel and AMD for a long time. And anybody that ate, made microprocessors either made them for networking or for audio chips or for whatever else. So they did a deal with ARM and said that the ARM architecture should be made available to anybody and everybody that wants to make a microprocessor for a very low cost. I think the licensing fee starts as low as 50,000 bucks. For a very low cost, you can set up your own virtual fab. You, you, you can set up your own virtual semiconductor company and tweak the ARM architecture and use fabs in China or Taiwan, mostly in Taiwan these days, and they'll make CPUs for you. About two years ago, about 150 companies jumped on that bandwagon. About 100 of them have failed, but 50 thrive. 50 do reasonably well, and seven, eight of them are, are doing volumes that would make people like Intel envious. But what it's done is that the cost of the CPU has collapsed. When uh, Apple introduced the iPad, a Cortex-A8 one gig processor cost them 35 bucks. Uh, today, the same caliber processor costs this is now barely four years later, cost two and a half dollars. In fact, our entry level processor uh, is a 1.3 gig dual core processor, so it's more in line with the third generation iPad, and that cost three and a half bucks. That drop in pricing has been more significant than has happened in the last 15 years uh, in what Intel and AMD did. And we see it dropping further down. In fact, we think that in the next couple of years, paying more than a buck for a CPU is just going to seem silly. We think that that's going to be the common kind of thing. They become commodities, and they're going to be commodities that deliver so much processing power at such a low cost that you, just, uh, you, know, you, you, you would never think about do you have enough or not. There was one more sort of personal experience that helped us do what we were doing. And, and you know, this is the anecdote about the silver lining. So in 2008, when the financial crisis, crisis happened, banks around the world started collapsing and the world's credit system came to a halt, um, many people in our industry started going bankrupt. Uh, many manufacturers around the world started going bankrupt. And there were only eight companies at that time providing the type of multi-touch projective capacitive touch screens that we needed for our devices. And they were all relatively busy doing work for very large customers. And the one that had decided they would work for us, unfortunately, went bust. So we were sitting here in the middle of 2008, and our business had just come to a standstill. Um, and we just couldn't figure out how to move this forward because the remaining seven companies said, well, when you can commit to a $100 million investment into, into us creating these touchscreens for you, let's have a discussion. Until then, it doesn't make sense. Um, but we had a little bit of an advantage. Um, we were in Canada. We were young kids that had gone to engineering school in Canada that felt that there's got to be a solution to this. And uh, the advantage that we had is that in our previous incarnation, 
1995, when we'd taken our first company public uh, on the NASDAQ, we'd used some of that excess money to set up a thin film fab in Montreal. Uh, because you know, when you take a company public and you make a little bit of money, people think of, so what do you do? Right? You buy an expensive car, or you buy some property, or you do something of that sort. And all of that seemed silly to us, because we thought, don't like fast cars. Um, at least not to own because they depreciate in value. Um, certainly don't like real estate because just require maintenance and, and don't, don't like that part of it. And we thought what we know a little bit about is technology and we'd love to have tools that we can continue um, experimenting with. And that's what we did. So we started putting money into this fab uh, with just the pure intent of experimentation. That's it. Didn't know we'd make anything out of it or not. Uh, and for many years, we didn't. In fact, for many years, the most useful part of this fab was that the people that we trained in that ended up developing the nanotechnology department at University of Montreal. And we get to say, hey, go, look, 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 look at their work. That's where it came from. Um, but in 2008, we thought, hey, there's got to be. This can't be this complicated. Uh, we've got vapor deposition equipment, we've got etching equipment, we've got both class 1000 and class 100 clean rooms. We've got to figure out how, to, how this is done. And, and we started working on it, lost a year in that process. Uh, but we started making our own touch screens. And today, um, the large majority of touch screens that get used in our products get made in Montreal. And the reason is that there's still a gap in the supply demand balance on touch screens. Million unit quantity in China for a seven inch projective capacitor touchscreen is about seven and a half bucks. In 2008 or 2009 when we made these, it was about 30 bucks. It was a huge differential. Except our cost to make these in Montreal is about two bucks, about two, two and a half dollars. And it's not that we make it that much cheaper than the Chinese, it's that the demand outstrips supply so significantly that the price is still multiples off of that. And the touch screens and the LCDs are the only parts left in low cost tablets or in tablet computers that have any margin in them. The CPU has no margin, right? Some guy did a design, used a virtual lab to get it made, works on a five to 8% margin and that's it. The rest of the electronics, the batteries, the plastics, the rest of them are large scale commodities that nobody's working at better than five to seven percent gross margin, except the touchscreens and LCDs. So a little bit of Google, a little bit of uh, the financial crisis, and ta-da, we had a low cost tablet computer. In fact, if you look at the reviews of our little tablet computer, some are relatively positive. But there's enough of them that aren't very appreciative of our efforts. Um, and and um, the, the, the critique that pinches me a lot always, of course, is they'll say, ah, it's just, I just used outdated technology. That's what they did. They used outdated technology to make these low cost devices. And um, it causes me to snicker because a few years ago, I'd read Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma, and, and if you've not read that book and, and you have a little bit of entrepreneurial streak in you, I truly recommend uh, one of the key books that, that you should truly read. And what he did was he showed in industry after industry what happens with regards to the evolution of the high-end product, which assumed that to be that orange line, and the low end product that lined below that, the dark blue line. And over time, what happens to their performance, and more importantly, the performance expectations of the low end market versus the high end market. The high end customer will always have higher expectations than the lower end customer. Except what you'll see over time is that the differential in the two starts to vanish and not only does the differential in the two start to vanish, but the lower end product 
not only meets but exceeds the expectations of even the higher end customer. So here was sort of the last three years worth of evolution of, of our uh, version against the iPad. And I, I should um, explain, we don't compete with the iPad. We don't try to compete with the iPad, except uh, it's, it's a great product to take pot shots at because they'll never acknowledge us. So, so you know, it's always to, great to do a David Goliath kind of a positioning when the Goliath will think it beneath them to actually even acknowledge you. So it's just like, fantastic, let's, let's go take pot shots at these guys all day long. Um, we started with a 366 megahertz ARM 11 processor with 256 megabytes of RAM. And the first iPad had a Cortex A8 one gig processor also with 256 megabytes of RAM. But then the next generation went up to a Cortex A8 with 512 megabytes. And that's what we started to supply into the market in India and to the Indian government at 35 bucks. And we asked the question, is this good enough for that target customer? It may not be good enough if you've got $800 to burn. Because you, you get all ranges of customers in every market. I remember pitching um, the Los Angeles School District. And they were very receptive and said, fantastic, you know, reasonable quality product at a great price. They said, but we've got a little bit of a dilemma. We've got $800 per student that we've got to spend. What do we do with the rest? I said, I'll get you teachers from India. <laughs> They'll come with a device. It, it didn't go over too well. Um, but there's LASD, the Los Angeles School District, and there's Compton right next to it. And the school board at Compton doesn't have a budget for books, let alone iPads for every student. The next generation iPad went on to a dual core, one gig processor, 512 RAM, and then uh, with a gig of RAM, and they're hovering around a 1.3 gig with a gig of RAM. And the last version that we supplied to the Indian government at about $42 is a 1.3 gig dual core processor and a gig of RAM. As far as processing power goes, and memory goes, it's good enough uses Android, has access to millions of Android apps, uh, and gives you a very respectable user experience. Where it lacks is it's not the Apple brand, it's not the Apple build. But if you think of a person whose monthly income is $150, and you think of billions of those people, and you think of a world economy that's growing at a 1.3% annual rate, and even in India, which is a, supposed to be this hyper growth economy of 5% a year, that $150 customer is not going to be able to afford an iPad for a long time to come. But a $30, $40 device that gives them the same amount of processing power and same amount of memory as that $400 device is truly good enough and delivers a good enough user experience for what they need. One of the key things, though, that, that also helped us was that we learned from some large companies on changing business models of hardware. This is, think about the power of free. Ultimately, a lot of products should be free. In fact, I think that by next summer, you know, when, the, when that pizza shop gives you that little card and stamps it every time you order pizza, and the 10th time you get a free pizza, the 10th time will be a tablet for you, not a free pizza. And that tablet will have an app that allows you to order more pizza. Uh, because it's gonna cost less than 20 bucks. And think of it as a customer acquisition tool. If the cost of customer acquisition is higher than the cost of something of this nature that creates an ongoing relationship with your prospective customer, then why not give one to every one of those customers? And think, continue thinking of the kind of environments that that can be deployed in. Grocery stores. If I can get you to come back in, if I can get you to keep tabs of your grocery lists and things of that nature, and if I can put them on every shopping cart and I can ping you based on your previous purchasing experiences and things of that nature, um, that is powerful to a lot of brands. Today, already you see um, large resorts, 
that use them. And the reason is that uh, they want you to be able to offer more products and services around the resort. Um, there's a, host there's a um, uh, restaurant chain in the U.S. that did an experiment. Um, if you're familiar with Applebee's in the U.S., they did an experiment with about 100 of their restaurants where instead of using tablets for, as menus, as, as, uh, as an order-taking mechanism, they decided to put them in the middle of each table, and all they would do is that the first seven minutes after somebody sits down is show these gorgeous pictures of appetizers, and by minute 24, they'd show these gorgeous pictures of, of desserts, and the sale of appetizers and desserts went up, high profit items, because they'd planted those seeds in your mind uh, by doing that. So what we discovered was that Amazon was selling a product called the Kindle Fire for $199 that was costing them $240 to make. And it had similar specs to what Samsung was selling for about $400. And here's the reason why. And we developed a business model around this. Hardware today accounts for less than a quarter of our profit. Tech support and warranties a little bit more. Network services accounts for a lot more of our profit than hardware does. Content and apps accounts for some. And then advertising accounts for a lot more. I did a pitch to an Indian wireless operator, and I did a calculation for him, and I showed him that Google makes four times the profit of all of the Indian wireless operators put together and doesn't charge their end user customer anything. Right? Gives away free search. And in return for advertising, in return for one out of every thousand people or so clicking on a link, they make enough to justify free search, right? $60 billion of cash sitting in the balance sheet, don't know what to do with that money by giving you free search. Well, what if you could deliver free internet, right? Think of the hardware as a customer acquisition tool. This is where I develop the relationship with the customer. But if I've got to sell them content apps or advertising, then I've got to deliver network access. What if I deliver network access for free? So we decided that that would be the business model. Low cost hardware, we don't sell it for a loss yet, but I wish to reach that stage sometime in the next couple of years that I could sell it for a loss. The models are already out there, and I'll, I'll give you an example of one recently. Um, Facebook's purchase of WhatsApp. Facebook just spent the equivalent of $43 per user to buy WhatsApp. So they bought a messaging app for $43 a user. Hang on. You can make devices for less than that, deliver free internet on that, and not only monetize the messaging app, you can monetize search, you can monetize email, you can monetize uh, content, uh, you can monetize uh, downloads. I mean, you can monetize lots of things. You can monetize that whole platform. In fact, uh, if you think of the $150 billion that, that Apple has uh, sitting on its balance sheet, remember, it would take less than a third of that to equip every student in the world with a tablet computer with free internet access, a third. That's it. So there's no lack of capital or lack of business models. And because of that, I'm very bullish that in the next three to five years or less, you're going to see billions of new people come on the internet, and, and it's going to change the scale of, of how we look at this. So we developed a technology in which we received 18 US patents. We create a parallel processing environment where we pre-process, pre-render a web page, then compress it, send it across. Think of the CNN page on average as two megabytes in size. We deliver the same look, feel, functionality of that page and consume maybe about 30 kilobytes. And we, when you can do that level of a reduction in the amount of content that you consume, then you can potentially deliver it for free. You can deliver it uh, by subsidizing that through advertising. So uh, in India, the average monthly user 
for us that would normally consume around 800 megabytes because this technology consumes only about 30 megabytes. And that 30 megabytes costs us about 12 cents. And we can generate double that in advertising revenue for that same level of browsing. So why bother charging the consumer for access? Give them basic free browsing within the cost of that device, and that proposition becomes, in our opinion, very, very compelling. The question becomes, you know, why would somebody want the internet? And, and you know, um, I ask this question many times I do talks at universities, and I say, well, if you're stranded in a deserted island and you have the option of a cell phone or the internet, which do you choose? And every once in a while, I get somebody that raises their hand on the cell phone and I say, leave, just go. Uh, because there's nothing as powerful as the internet, right? Look, if you want to learn how to build that boat to get off that island, you can learn that on the internet. If you want to figure out which berries you're allowed to eat and which you're not, you can learn that on the internet. Um, you know, in the Arab Spring, people communicated with each other on social networking and overthrew a dictator because of the power of the internet. You know, this is the most powerful thing humanity has ever created. And it's still shocking to me how few people realize that. I, I don't suggest that it's a silver bullet. I'm not suggesting it solves everything. It doesn't mean that you can turn your blind eye to polio and, and you know, all other kinds of issues. But when I do talks in the developing world, and especially in universities in Nicaragua and India and Mexico and elsewhere, what I highlight is that I don't think that somebody from Silicon Valley is going to come down here and resolve the issues that you face. I think those issues are going to get resolved by people in that environment, I truly believe. Because sitting here, we don't understand those issues. We truly don't. Uh, I'll give you a, uh, an, an anecdote of how different the environment becomes over there. I remember seeing an ad in a magazine that showed, uh, that highlighted a minivan with a s driver's seat that lays down 360 degrees. That's it. That was the innovation in this minivan being highlighted in this magazine ad. And I thought, how dumb is that? Why would you need the driver's seat to lay down 360 degrees? Well, if you travel to those places, you realize that most of those minivans are being used as taxis, and those people that drive those taxis actually live in those taxis, and they need to sleep at night, and they need that, that seat to go down 360 degrees, and it's a compelling feature. Um, I truly believe that education will resolve most ills that humanity faces, and the scale uh, and the issue that needs to be resolved, I think, is very significant. There's a professor by the name of Sugata Mitra that did, does these hole-in-the-wall experiments. And if you've never, never heard of him, go to YouTube, type in hole-in-the-wall experiments, and watch his TED Talks. And what he did was he took a standardized math test and gave it to students around New Delhi. And he got scores in the mid-60s. And he went out further and further from New Delhi. And by the time he got out, 200, 250 kilometers, that same test was causing results of 20% and 15% and 13%. And what he was trying to illustrate was that the best quality teachers in that environment don't end up in rural India. They end up in the big cities. There's safety, there's security, there's better living standards, better pay, um, and they just don't end up in rural India. We have the same problem in Canada. The far northern native communities don't get the best teachers. The best teachers and the best professors end up here. They just don't end up 1,800 kilometers north of here. In fact, if you look at the dropout rates, uh, the, the, they're shocking. Grades 5 to 8, one of the studies showed 43% of the kids drop out. So almost half the kids that enter grade 5 in rural India don't get past grade 8. And those that get past grade 8 get to grade 9, two-thirds of them don't graduate high school. Now, government figures will never tell you that the number of kids that are not in school 
are the difference that you see there. But if you extrapolate those numbers, while there's 220 million kids in school, the number that should be in school comes to 360. 140 million, about you know, four or five times the population of Canada. Uh, the government figures would be a lot less because you know, admitting that is, is a scary kind of thing. Will low-cost tablet computers and internet solve everything? Of course not. But for those that want to have access to that information, that want to be able to further that education, it goes a long way. And it's not just India, it is throughout Africa and Latin America that you face those kinds of issues. And then there are countries like Afghanistan. We're working with an NGO called Future Billions, and they work with mothers in environments where parents are afraid to send their daughters to school because of safety issues. So they smuggle these tablets to people's homes and, and they try to teach mothers who've never been, never stepped into a classroom in their lives how to transfer the content, how to get their kids to the discipline to sit down and go through that content. So to us, this is one of the two killer apps. Parents will spend on their kids' education because they realize that that's the way out of poverty. And, and you don't need to sell it to them. You just don't need to sell it to them. If, if they can understand that this will help the kids' education, that's all that's necessary. We've been evangelizing this with governments around the world and have been lucky enough that a number of governments have started to do very broad scale deployments from Turkey to Mexico to Uruguay to Venezuela and other countries around the world have decided that as kids have books from kindergarten onwards, they should have tablet computers from kindergarten onwards and they're doing very broad, broad, large scale deployments. The other one of course is commerce. Irrespective of what size of business you have, if I can show you how you can make more money on that business, then you'll take advantage of the technology. And personally, I'm a big believer that Alibaba.com has had more to do with China and China's growth than the Chinese government. And the reason is that if you think of an artisan sitting at Turquoise Mountain in Afghanistan making jewelry, the same thing that they sell for 20 bucks ends up at Macy's in New York at $400 because there's a lot of friction in the distribution chain. Right? Lots of tiers of margin and so on. Whereas the person making $4, a four-person company making uh, this pen some, or, or, or some component of this pen in Shenzhen or Guangdong or someplace in China is able to get it to a buyer the other end of the world using this platform. $200 billion of transactions happen on Alibaba.com and you see their IPO and you see their market cap, the recognition of the power of what they're doing reflects the reason why their market cap exceeds uh, Amazon and eBay and, and, and others and so on. People will spend on something that'll generate income for their business or improve their business. And we believe that that's the second killer app. And these are the two areas we focus on, education being, being the first one. The question becomes, will they buy it? You know, all this sounds great in theory, but will the consumer actually buy a product of this nature? And I apologize in advance for this little bit of self-promotion, but uh, this was our experience. We entered the Indian market in 2011. The total market was 250,000 units. And most people didn't believe that tablets would take off in India. You know, what's a tablet? You need a smartphone, you need a laptop. Tablet, something in the middle for somebody that already has a smartphone and a laptop. And we believe, no, no, this would be the poor man's computer. So you can't think of it in the same manner as you think of it in North America. It's a very different market. And most tablets being sold in India um, were either Apple or Samsung. And they controlled 80% of the market. And our target was to figure out how to sell 50,000 units a year. That's it, because we thought, hey, that's what we were doing in UK at that time, and we thought, you know, India is a much bigger market, but we've got to do 50,000 a year. And every distribution partner we talked to thought that that was a silly number, that just, look, 
80% of the market is Apple and Samsung. Out of that remaining 20%, there's HP and Lenovo and Indian brands like Micromax and Carbon and ITCL and a bunch of others and so on. And you have no brand and no identity in that market and you're not going to get any market share. We hadn't launched our product yet, but what we were supplying to the Indian government got announced by the Indian government. It made front page news in every national paper that we came across. Not only front page news, in most of them it made the front page headline news uh, on that day. And we started getting, getting demand. In fact, before we had launched commercially, we received four million, we call them pre-orders, or at least expressions of interest from four million consumers. And we hadn't yet launched commercially. We, we were months away from launching commercially. And by the start of 2013, we became the largest supplier of tablet computers into the Indian market, independent of what we supply the Indian government. Again, I don't think we take away a single customer from Apple or Samsung. Even their volumes increased, but we introduced a new segment that nobody thought would have demand. In fact, it's very funny, a few weeks ago, there were some reports that came out that said that the tablet market is in its tail end, that it's, it's starting to reach saturation. Here, maybe. Not there. There are a billion people that still don't use the internet. And uh, unless Microsoft and Intel decide to start making $30 computers with free internet access, they're not addressing that market. And we started to get responses from around the world, from Mexico to Afghanistan to places around Africa. And uh, education appeals to, to every segment of society. In fact, so much so that we went from um, barely three or four million dollars in revenue about three years ago uh, where we ex to where we expect to uh, by, by next quarter be at a hundred million revenue run rate and listed ourselves on the Toronto Stock Exchange in, in July and raised a bunch of funding. Um, I, I was told to do that pump up thing on, on there uh, <laughs> otherwise it's just not in my nature to do to do that. Uh, and we believe that this generates a lot of opportunities. If you can truly believe that billions of new people are going to get on the internet, think of all the opportunities that come from that. And it won't be hardware. Hardware isn't the big opportunity. The hardware guys are going to kill themselves to go out and you know, it's a commodity. It's going to be stuff like Instagram. It's going to be stuff like WhatsApp. And the reason is it's going to be good user interfaces. A good user interface today is worth a billion dollars easily. Six, com six person company, Instagram, creates a user interface that allows people to share pictures and tag them and make comments. That's it. How complicated is that? It's a good, good user interface. And got sold for, I don't know, how many ever billions they, get, they got sold for. If you can figure out the content and the apps in that environment, that's where the billion dollar opportunities are. Think of what that customer can take advantage of. Realize that they have low levels of literacy in a lot of that environment. So good graphical user interfaces will go really a long way to what they need. Certainly, there are hardware and then accessories around that um, the, the one of our best-selling accessory is uh, this little case, which is a little keyboard built in. No special invention from us, except we buy it for about two dollars and eighty cents, and sell it for five bucks. That's it, and you buy it at the Future Shop for forty-nine ninety-nine. That's that, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's a different story, but. Lots of little accessories that that that'll generate some some funding uh, that'll generate some revenue opportunities around that, and of course, internet access will generate revenue. But in the next five years or less, I guarantee you that the number of internet users in the world will 
at least double. If it doesn't go from two and a half billion to five billion, I'd be shocked, utterly shocked. Some using tablets and phablets, a lot using smartphones, but they will be using the internet. And try to imagine what happens when that happens. How does education change? How does innovation change? How does your competitiveness change? Right? You're going to be in a global world where in the past the advantages the West had first was land and mineral resources. Right? That worked great for a couple hundred years. You had the Industrial Revolution, you had access to lots of mineral resources. What happens next? What happens when those technological barriers don't exist? And the kid engineer working at 150 bucks a month is hungrier than any of us is, right? And they have access to the internet, <laughs> which they didn't a couple of years ago. Um, our role in this, it ultimately may not be as grandiose as we claim to be, but it's going to be a fantastic ride. And um, nothing like, as you can imagine, being part of that ride. And I hope, if nothing else, this gives you some food for thought as to where the opportunities lie and, and you can sort of come up with ideas. Um, when, when the Indian Prime Minister recently visited uh, Washington, uh, U.S., uh, he, he, he made an appeal to people of Indian origin. He said, go find five Indians, f five non-Indians, people with not an Indian background, and get them to go visit India. Um, he was thinking of it from a, from a um, uh, tourism perspective. Uh, I'm thinking of it from an entrepreneurial perspective. To identify the opportunities that the next two, three, four billion people are going to generate, you need to understand their environment. Thank you for having me. Uh, I hope this, uh, th this was uh, interesting and uh, would love to spend some time taking questions um, and being told I'm full of it. Uh, if uh, if you want to engage in real interesting conversations. I'm just wondering what, uh, what you see your usage rates are, what area people are actually using these things with, uh, and where you think it's going to go. You mean geographic or applications? No, I mean for applications or for what people are actually doing with the tablets. So think of the exact same things that were common here 10 years ago. And, and, and try to search that on the, on the web. Some of them I won't mention, but are obvious. Um, uh, we pitch education, and education is a big part of it. Gaming is a big part of it. Killing time <laughs> is a big part of it. Uh, watching movies in that environment is a big part of it. Um, killing time and watching movies isn't what's driving in the buying decision. The buying decision is being driven by either a need for education or an impact on commerce. Um, but the other applications that if you start searching online, you, you'll, you'll start to see um, uh, that are very common. Okay. Um, a lot of the challenges that you've described in India and other parts of the world um, are paralleled in First Nations communities in Canada. Um, is there any um, activity there um, in, in uh, getting uh, your products in, into the hands of, of those people? So, so we do work with some NGOs that, that, that are making some efforts in that regards. Uh, it's not taken off in, in any big kind of way. We, we do have some schools and some communities that are using them. Um, but not at the scale that you'd think that there'd be adoption. So there's, there's no interest from federal government or provincial governments, for it's, example? It's a difficult thing, 
for, for the federal government. Because remember, the governments will work on infrastructure, will work on policy matters. Um, the moment they decide that subsidizing hardware is part of what they do, um, uh, it, it creates different kinds of challenges. Now, there are school boards around Canada that use them in Alberta and Nova Scotia and here in Ontario that use these devices and, and take advantage of them. Uh, most schools across Canada now have a bring your own device kind of uh, uh, program for, for students and, and they look at students that may not have access or may not be willing or able to spend or parents that, that are unable to spend uh, you know, a couple hundred bucks for a tablet and, and they point them in this, in this direction. Um, uh, but I, I think that uh, in Canada, it, it's still going to take a little while before you see broad adoption in curriculums. Um, the, the challenges and the results and, and the impact is just so much more significant in some of these countries that it's a no-brainer, right? Uh, you know, if you look at the studies that have been done in North America, they don't show positive results in a big way, right? They turn around and they say, hey, when we took these set of students uh, in Berkeley, California, and they used tablets for X number of years, and those that didn't, uh, what was the difference? And there wasn't much. And, and, and part of the reason is that the ones that didn't also had computers at home anyways. So it wasn't you know, a true test. But if you compare it to rural India, and you say that the average school is a one room, one teacher school, and a third of the time that teacher doesn't show up, in that environment, the impact is a lot more significant than, than here. Right, but, but there's lots of parts of Canada that are like that. Th that have issues, uh, and, and certainly, uh, you know, the native communities uh, have. Um, uh, but, you know, th there's some, there are bits and pieces. There, there are pockets of interest uh, that, that may evolve. But, um, so you said earlier that the internet didn't have enough towers or like th the access point wasn't that immense. So how did you overcome that? And in the follow up to that question, um, so if let's say one does buy that product in India, do they have to pay like a separate monthly fee for internet or the government, because you have an agreement with them, they l let the user have the internet? Okay, so the first one is that um, the most of the network in India, or 80% of the network in India, has a capacity of only about 20 or 30 kilobits per second, right? So what happens is the CNN page, for example, will take three minutes or two minutes to download in that environment. It just takes a huge amount of time, and nobody's going to wait two minutes for a web page to, 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 to download. With what we do, we reduce the size of that page down to 30 kilobytes. And when it's only 30 kilobytes, on that same pipe, it takes five, six seconds or something, and, and suddenly starts to become usable. But what's happened is that the 30 kilobytes, the cost of that data is a lot less than the cost of two megabytes worth of data, right? So somebody, instead of consuming 800 megabytes in a month, will only consume 30 megabytes. When we buy, and so instead of the government, we work with wireless operators, and we buy wholesale access from the wireless operators, and we the cost of that access for that 30 megabytes is around 12 cents. And we generate advertising revenue or we bundle it into the cost of the hardware and say to the consumer, here it is, access is free, you buy this low cost device and, and go get yourself a BSNL, BSNL is the operator that we work with currently in India, get yourself a BSNL SIM and you activate this plan on it and you get free, free browsing on that plan. Um, but that compression technology, that acceleration technology that we create has a, has a lot to do with being able to offer free access. And we, we realize that hardware alone can't do it. You, know, you, you can't do hardware without looking at connectivity and uh, you can't do it without looking at content and apps. So that ecosystem requires all three of those uh, to come together to be, to be effective. So just a follow up to this question, you talked about free internet, that you pitched that idea to some of the tel telecom companies. What was their response and did anyone agree to do that in, in coming future? So BSNL has agreed and, and it's offered currently in southern India and western India. Um, we are hoping that before the end of this year that we, we announce two more operator relationships to do that. Remember, it's free to the consumer not free by the operator. 
So the operator is actually charging us. And on a per megabyte basis, they're charging us more than if you were a consumer buying it. So if you were a consumer you, and you need a lot of data and you bought yourself a three gig or four gig data plan, on a per megabyte basis, you'd be paying less than what we pay the operator, even though we're buying many terabytes of data from them. Uh, and uh, how we're able to convince them and our, our pitch to them is that when they think of data, our target customer isn't somebody they've ever sold data to. Right? This is why they haven't set up 3G networks across the country, because they don't perceive that market to exist. So we're bringing a brand new customer to them, and that customer uses this as a stepping stone. You know, th this experience may not be the ultimate experience. Um, you know, as the networks improve and other things happen, they'll, be, you know, th th they'll move on to higher end services uh, beyond what we can deliver in a free environment. But at least as the starting point, it gets them exposed to it. Right? How about, uh, do you use, so, so for example, adult education, for example, farmers, uh, you know, to give forecasts and things, or <clears throat> for example, I'm thinking of, we work uh, in chronic kidney disease in Sri Lanka. Uh, you know, sometimes they don't have these latest, uh, they talk in Colombo, all the, you know, in seminar rooms, but that uh, information does not get down to the, the farmer out there. How, how about this? Do you have experience? Yeah, so we've got NGOs that, that do that, right? And it, it's very interesting. Part of what they've done is that they've created communities around that. So farmers take pictures and they upload them of different kinds of things and say, hey, is this something that's going to drop my, the, kill my crop uh, of new bugs they've spotted or other things? And they, they learn tricks from each other and, 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 and so on. And one of the big things that, that's changed, not just because of us, but, but certainly uh, around cell phones over the last few years, is the ability to get best market pricing, right? So if a farmer who has no ability to refrigerate his produce uh, has got to carry that a day uh, to get to wherever the auction site where he's going to deliver it, he's at the mercy of that price that the person offers. And because he has no ability to take it back home, wait two days, get it to another auction site, and so on. So a lot of that's already gone online. Uh, it happens by text messaging on cell phones and so on. The additional element that these tablets are offering is that they get access to videos and new procedures and processes and new ways of improving their crop returns and so on. So, so there's you know, lots of different areas that, that, that you start to see benefits um, that just weren't, weren't possible before. Um, so you mentioned that you compress large websites like CNN into 30 kilobytes and deliver. Where exactly is that compression happening? Is the request rerouted to a compression engine and then delivered to the device, or sure. how does that actually work? So we run in an IBM hosting facility, a server from outside of Montreal. So all the traffic gets proxy routed to those proxy servers in Montreal. And the technology is relatively straightforward. We pre-process, pre-render a web page, then we compress it, we send it across. If you think of the, uh, what comprises, comprises of a web page, 75% uh, of the content on a web page is the instruction set. Um, you know, HTML was supposed to be this, this great new language that was very light, and it has become the worst programmed, bloated garbage of a language where nobody actually programs in HTML anymore, right? They use these third-party softwares that add huge amounts of bloat to it and so on. And two, you know, 75% of a web page, uh, if, if, if you start downloading and you save them on your hard drive, and you get rid of the pictures and you get rid of the text that you see, and you see what's left, it's 75 to 80% uh, is the instruction set. So if you pre-process, pre-render, compress that, send that across, the kind of, of data reduction that you get is very, very significant. So is a similar principle applied for like web uh, video-based services as well, or is that streamed? It can be, but for video-based, what happens is you, you generally require both heavy memory and heavy processing power locally, because in video-based services, what they do is that they see what the changes in the frames are. So instead of refreshing the frame, they refresh a set of pixels, right? This is why video-based services work really well for news broadcasts, right? Because the number pixels that are changing are minimal, uh, you know, the whole overall frame, frame changes a lot less. Um, 
So it doesn't, what we do doesn't as well apply to that, um, but uh, there's a different kind of effort being made around, around video. Okay, um, so this is a bit of a philosophical future type thing. Um, so your service and a lot of services, so you were mentioned Instagram, are based on ad revenue and um, getting people, making a really good user interface to get people to actually use it to get the exposure for people wanting to buy ads on it. Now as we move into the future and if well, maybe everybody's model shifts towards that, is there kind of like, well the well of ad revenue run dry. I mean, now Google, they make this much money in ad revenue. I mean, the money that the advertisers are paying for Google is coming from their revenue from actually real products. So when a lot of the wealth in the world and the products and people's, um, I'm just wondering, do you expect like that proportion to change in the future? I don't think so. I, I think that they've, if they overdo do it, they'll kill their their service, right? People just won't use it. Um, I, I think there'll be a fine balance that will be driven. Think of TV. Yeah. And they, they, they've, they've discovered a model. Um, in 30 minutes worth of TV, there is six and a half minutes worth of, pro of advertising. There's 23 and a half minutes worth of actual programming. And they've got to divide that advertising up in at least four slots uh, for it to be palatable to you. Otherwise, you just wouldn't watch it. Um, and, and, and I think that the web page layouts have also evolved in a manner that, that you know, the advertising can be in certain environments. Pop-ups may or may not be effective in certain environments. Uh, so, so you know, there's, there's, a, there's almost an art to balancing that. Um, if you think of markets that are already evolved, right? North America is a prime example, okay? Um, Google was able to show that from pure targeted search, they can make a lot more than, you know, think of all the portals, Yahoo and all the ones that just don't exist anymore um, that, that uh, had big banners and this and that and lots of things and so on. So what advertising has shown is that the more you know about your customer, the better it is um, and, and the higher the value of the ad that you can deliver. Yeah, but I, I was trying more to get at, um, and there's like seemingly this endless reservoir of uh, advertisers that want to pay for advertising, right? But as more and more services are advertising driven in the future, you can kind of foresee a saturation where maybe the advertiser market isn't big enough? Do you have, or do you think it will just keep growing and that there will be other different types of... I think you'll reach a balance similar to what you see on TV, yeah. right? These are mature markets. Even in that part of the world, they're mature markets. And you'll have to create the... The, the content providers will have to be willing to live f at, for whatever that amount of advertising can generate for them, right? They, they won't be able to overdo it uh, as one. And, and I think that there'll always be enough opportunity. Uh, and this is you know, the power of the internet. If only five people are gonna read my content, then the value of the ad that I can place on there is X. And there'll be somebody who's willing to value that ad at that X price and, and pay for it. Um, you know, I, I often get the question, you, you know, when you think of the developing world, geez, t t which advertiser wants to go after a customer whose monthly income is 140 bucks? All of them do. Uh, you know, the fast-moving consumer goods industries, uh, uh, toothpaste and shampoo and this and that, uh, people selling jeans and beauty products and anything and everything you can imagine, uh, those are unchartered markets. Uh, you know, it's, it's like going to a place where people don't wear shoes and saying, hey, there's no market for it and discovering, hey, by the way, you know, <laughs> I got a huge market. Nobody's wearing shoes here. Uh, so, so it's, for, you know, the, the, the level of opportunity is very, very significant. Uh, and uh, technology of this nature will offer reach to that consumer that wasn't there. Right? You can go online. Uh, you can buy it on our website. Uh, Canadian pricing is thirty-seven ninety-nine. Uh, and uh, what do we sell the cases for in Canada? For, for fourteen ninety-nine. 
we wholesale it for five bucks. You can go to India, we can get it here for five, <laughs> five bucks. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I uh, work very closely with an orphanage in India, um, mostly trying to promote education and with the little girls that are around there. And potentially they could be interested in something like this, more of so because we try to deliver books and workbooks and educational material, but it's so hard to deliver that there. So would the best thing be to talk to you or someone directly or go online, the website? No, no. Connect with me and I'll connect you with the right people within the organization. If you go online, then you're going to get whatever the retail pricing is. If you connect with me and, you know, uh, sort of that group of people within the organization that wants to extend that, then, then the likelihood that, that you'll get a donation to get started with is much higher. And so what is your position on the advertising that uh, then reaches into these untapped markets? Uh, like, how do you see the effects of that? It generally is beneficial to them? I think it is a good thing. And, and I'll tell you why. It allows access, right? For us, that can have a way to, you know, spending $40 or $300 isn't a financial decision for me. You know, for most of us in this room, it's going to be a decision based on, you know, the amount of mental energy we're willing to devote to something is based on features and, 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 and product brand and those kinds of things. We're not making a decision based on our financial capability most often in that kind of price range. Uh, the person whose monthly income is 140 bucks and they're spending half of that on food is making a purely financial decision if that's going to help their business or if it's going to help the education of their child. So in that environment, while that child is playing games, I'm very happy to put ads in there, right? And that person is very happy to, 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 to pay for that. Look, we, we, we saw it in North America, uh, you know, when Google initially started, there were lots of search engines. There was no shortage of search engines before Google started. And there were a lot of paid search engines out there. The best search engines were just paid. You subscribed to a service, you had scientific search engines, and you had uh, uh, search engines that had e-books on it and so on. You paid, you know, 10, 20, 30 bucks a month to, have to, that, to get to that service, right? Google killed them all with free and decided that they had found the right balance of advertising. Right. Um, you know, these are the kind of experiments that people at Facebook are doing. If they overdo it, they'll kill their user base. They've got to figure out how to do it so it's part of the experience without a lot of pushback from the consumer. So you know, is it evil? I don't think so. Uh, it, it, you know, um, uh, we, all of us still go to the movies and watch TV and so on despite the advertising that's there. Um, you know, we still read newspapers just and magazines that despite the advertising that's there. Here it's interesting because it's kind of sort of nested within your textbook in a way because of that. Not necessarily in your textbook. In certain areas, we, we've got to stay off of limit. We've got to stay off okay. of those, right? Um, we, we've got to be, again, we've got to be careful in, in how deeply we plant it and where we plant it because the negative reaction from the consumer but, uh, is is, is going to be exactly that, right? Um, uh, I remember one reviewer said, oh, it's an ad-infested uh, something something. And I had to go argue against that and say, no, 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 no. It's, it's in certain environments, right? Somebody's created a game, and while you play that game for free, it's got an ad. You can spend three bucks for that same game on the, on, on the Play Store, and, uh, and you're okay with it. And, and, and get rid of the ad. Um, but otherwise, you've got to live with that ad. Um, and, and, and look, the consumer cares less about it. We care somewhat in this room. The reviewers care somewhat. Um, but the consumer, at least in that environment, doesn't care. What is the next step you plan to intend? So uh, certainly, you know, it's a huge market, right? Um, and we, we are barely a fraction of the way there. Uh, I think the total number of units we've placed in India is maybe about 1.4 million. Um, reported in big Business Magazine that goes in the Globe and Mail, 
uh, did a story on us uh, a couple of years ago, and the front cover story said the race to the next billion or something of that sort. And my seven-year-old keeps asking me how, how am I doing on that race. And one day I explained to him that I had hit a million, and he said, okay, so tell me, so how far along, you know, so, so when do you get to a billion? And I tried to explain to him how many millions get into a billion and how long it'll take me to get there. And he just was very disappointed <laughs> with that, that we're not making enough progress. So it's a, it's a huge market, huge opportunity. Uh, and uh, to continue harnessing that opportunity, uh, the key for us is going to be to drive pricing down very, very hard. Uh, our target, uh, you know, you, you, you can go online to our website right now, buy this for $37.99 in Canada. Uh, our target for next summer is $19.99 uh, with the same kind of features and functionality. And we're going to continue driving that down. Now, you may feel very unhappy that you spent that extra $18. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, to, to us, it's going to be continue driving that price down very, very hard. And while the free internet component of it right now we only offer for a year, I want to try to figure out, can I sustain that for a lifetime? Can I sustain that forever? May I have a question? Isn't it psychological that if something is cheap, it's not worth it? Or is sure. It sure. It, it is. And the thing is that if your monthly income is, you know, 6000 bucks a month, then are you going to spend $300 or $400 for something you're going to make that decision, right? If your monthly income was at 6,000 bucks, okay, and the difference, these are the proportions, was buying a $2,000 computer or buying a $20,000 computer, okay, then because the $20,000 computer is just so far out of your reach, you know, $150 a month, three months worth of salary, right, to get to a $500, $450 iPad. So $6,000 a month salary, three times that, so 18, 20,000 bucks. So if the decision was, do I buy the $20,000 computer, you're gonna recognize that your $2,000 option doesn't compete with that $20,000 option. But the fact that you have an option in itself is something that is compelling. So, so if it is three months worth of your salary, then you don't care. If it was, you know, three hundred, you know, against that $6,000, it was $300 or $400, you'd say, you know what, I'd spend that extra 100 bucks if I get a better brand, if I get better build, if I get better features, and so on. Money you won't care as much about in there. Two G network in India. So I'm just wondering what would be the reasons for having such a poor network infrastructure? The reason is the cost of that infrastructure and the inability to drive revenue from that. So the operators looked at it and said, hey, if the cost of those devices is, are out of reach, and I'm not going to be able to drive higher revenues from that customer base, do I spend those billions of dollars to set up that infrastructure? And they just didn't. Look, on an average metropolitan city in India, there are 13 operators. So there's hyper competition. There's competition like we've never seen in Canada, okay? Like I remember a few years ago, um, uh, when we, for the first time, started to get free incoming calls, and that was considered a big innovation. You know, hey, we can get free incoming calls. There are operators in India that pay you for incoming calls. For every eight minutes of incoming calls, you get one minute of free outgoing calls. Uh, so so there, you know, the, there's hyper competition, and if the opportunity existed, one of those guys would go out and do it. And the problem is that they look at it and they say, look, I'm going to sell data to a customer base that can't afford to buy devices, has had no exposure to the internet, right? Should I be doing it or not? What we're hoping when I call this a stepping stone is we're hoping that we can go into that environment, even with 2G, and say, here it is, okay? Again, you won't get the best video streaming, but you'll be able to do your Facebook, your email, Wikipedia, news, other things, and so on, right? And as you get hooked onto that and you start to take advantage of those, those the, the, you know, what the internet offers, uh, it, it would make sense for the operators to start jumping in and saying, hey, let me be the first one to build a 3G or a 4G network here uh, to take advantage of that. But 
You, you'll find this everywhere in the world. And throughout the developing world, 3G is concentrated around the big metropolitan cities, but the reality is in most of these places, two thirds of the population is rural. Um, and and you know, the operators haven't expanded to that environment. Okay. And my other question, talking about opportunities, what do you think about wearable devices? So um, I'm sure there will be opportunities. I don't understand them myself yet, okay? And, and I'll explain why. Um, most of us, can I ask how, how many here wear a watch? Right? Can you imagine what that number was 10 years ago? Right? There'd be nobody walking around without a watch. Why don't the rest of us wear watches? Well, we got cell phones, right? That's why we don't wear watches. Uh, they keep better timing, okay? They're more accurate, they got alarms built in, they got so many other things and, and so on. Um, and I, I have issues with wearables for that reason, right? Um, so not to say that, that there won't be opportunities that'll come from it, okay? Um, but I think that the initial opportunities may not be consumer opportunities. There may be other kinds of enterprise opportunities, right? Uh, my f son, my older son, when he was 11, we discovered he had type 1 diabetes, okay? So they start pricking their finger five times a day to check blood sugar and so on, and it's painful and so on. And you know, there's enough technology around uh, that if they can put a defibrillator and valve in your, in, your, in, your, in your heart, that they can put in the, a small circuit that, that measures your blood sugar levels and, and you know, gives off a reading using RF or something else, uh, which would be a lot more accurate. You don't need to prick your finger every, and so on, right? And, and we, we've got people here that, that, that can talk about that a lot more than, than I can. I, I think you'll start to see those kinds of interesting applications. Um, I'm looking forward to experimenting with the, with the um, um, Apple Watch. Uh, I don't know, uh, it, you know I, I don't know yet, right? And, and I don't want to discount it because uh, I just don't know. Uh, I've tried the Google Glasses and I'm not a fan of those, right? Um, I, how many here use a Bluetooth headset? Very, very small portion, right? Although you'd think it would make a lot of sense, but despite the fact that the cost is negligible, right? This cost of a good Bluetooth headset is almost nothing now. Despite that, uh, not enough people are, uh, not enough people use them. So I have concerns. Uh, the Google Glasses I had issues with. I, I just, um, I, I couldn't justify myself using it. I mean, I used it for a day and, and then it was just an inconvenient, you know, kind of thing. I'd spend most of my time answering questions about it than, yeah. <laughs> than anything else, so. Okay, great. So I want to thank Sunit very much for joining us today. I think we've had a wonderful conversation. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to continue it. We have snacks out in the fishbowl, okay? And so please approach him and follow up with some of those questions that maybe you didn't ask while you were here. Uh, I have a, a gift for you. So it's right behind you. I think you're closer to it than I am. Um, but it's just a small token of our appreciation Hope you remember Waterloo. Okay, so thank you very much. Um,